the Kentucky National Guard has a long and distinguished history of service to the Commonwealth and our nation. Always standing ready and willing to assist the citizens of Kentucky or to answer the call to arms of our country, the Kentucky National Guard has been there. Let us take you on a journey back in time to a very turbulent time and place in our nation's early history to tell the story of when the Kentucky militia answered our nation's first call to arms. It is called the War of 1812. For most folks, that is when it started. But for Kentuckians, this conflict had already been underway, off and on, for decades. The movement of settlers into Kentucky from the eastern colonies in the 1770s had triggered a merciless war between those settlers and the Indians. The British quickly joined the fighting as allies to the Indians. For those bloody decades, the struggle had been characterized by raids back and forth across the Ohio River, Indians and British troops making forays against settlements on the highly prized soil of Kentucky. Settlers, soon organized as the Kentucky Militia, burning Indian towns in lands that would later become the states of Ohio and Indiana. This fighting became the Western Front of the American Revolution. But the American victory in 1783 brought only a pause in the fighting, and the two sides continued to strike out at each other. Kentucky militiamen helped win some important victories, notably at the Battle of Fallen Timbers in 1794. But they suffered unforgettable defeats under Generals Harmer and St. Clair. By 1811, the tide seemed to be in favor of the American settlers out to claim land in the territories of the Old Northwest. To the Indians, a fearsome flood of white faces was pushing northward. The Shawnee tribe, long among the most dedicated and effective combatants in this extended conflict, provided a new generation of leaders dedicated to preserving Indian lands and lifestyles. A pair of Shawnee brothers inspired and organized a new round of resistance. One brother, known as the Prophet, inspired. He rallied against the whites with religious fervor. The other brother, Tecumseh, organized. He worked to unite Native Americans into a grand confederation to stop the white invaders by force of arms. This prequel to the War of 1812 came to a dramatic climax in November 1811. American troops, including many Kentuckians and led by Indiana Territorial Governor William Henry Harrison, defeated an Indian force near the Prophet's Camp alongside Tippecanoe Creek in the Indiana Territory. This hard-fought battle severely disrupted Indian plans, but it was hardly a permanent impediment to their ambitions. Kentuckians and other Western settlers did not hold the Indians solely responsible for these troubles. They blamed the British for stirring up the Indians' passions and for making the Native Americans truly dangerous by providing weapons and other supplies. Soon after the Battle of Tippecanoe, in a statement to the Kentucky legislature, Governor Charles Scott made the following comment. The hand of British intrigue is not difficult to be perceived in this thing. The movements of the savage in that quarter have indicated it for some time past. Kentuckians began to see Canada, the great British stronghold in North America, as both a fount of troubles and a target. Perhaps they began to think that American conquest of Canada might bring a permanent end to the Indian threat. This was the dark mood of Kentuckians as the year 1812 began. Tensions between the United States and Great Britain worsened during the opening months of 1812. While harassment of American vessels at sea, one of the main points of conflict, meant little to most Kentuckians, they enthusiastically supported the American move toward war. This would, they were certain, bring on the campaign against Canada they had come to see as essential to their peace and prosperity. 
Kentucky Congressman Henry Clay was one of the war hawks pushing for open war with Britain. He was so confident of success that he declared, "'The conquest of Canada is in your power. I trust I shall not be deemed presumptuous when I state that I verily believe that the militia of Kentucky are alone competent to place Montreal and Upper Canada at your feet.'" Most Kentuckians agreed with him. By April, the United States Congress instituted an embargo on trade with Britain and began preparations for war. On June 18, 1812, Congress declared war. Kentuckians had their war, and Kentuckians volunteered enthusiastically to fight in it both as members of the Kentucky militia and as recruits in new regiments for the regular army. During recruiting activities at Louisville, an old veteran was overheard to say, Well, well, Kentucky has often glutted the market with hemp, flour, and tobacco, and now she's done it with volunteers. The invasion of Canada began right away. General William Hull, governor of Michigan Territory, led American troops into British territory from Detroit and captured the town of Sandwich. Hull soon found his army isolated, its supply line southward into Ohio, cut by Tecumseh's Indians, who were at least as eager for this fight as were their Kentucky foes. Then Hull's army in Detroit came under attack by British regulars, Canadian militiamen, and Indians under the leadership of General Isaac Brock. Hull surrendered. This was an embarrassing and costly beginning to the war for Americans. But worse was to come, especially for Kentuckians. A militia army had been formed at Georgetown, Kentucky, intended to reinforce Detroit. Undeterred by Detroit's fall, these militiamen marched northward across Ohio, then into the Indiana Territory to relieve the besieged Fort Wayne. While the Kentuckians were at Fort Wayne, a grand plan was formulated that would unite the army with others from western Pennsylvania and southern Ohio for a winter campaign to liberate Detroit. From Fort Wayne, General James Winchester led the Kentuckians forward to the strategic Maumee Rapids. By now, it was January 1813, and the poorly equipped Kentuckians were suffering in the northern winter. But they pressed on. Winchester sent a detachment farther forward, hoping to rescue loyal residents of the little community of Frenchtown in the Michigan Territory from harassment by the Indians and British. Soon, over 700 Kentuckians and local militiamen faced off against a much smaller group of Canadians, British, and Indians, mainly Potawatomi, near the Raisin River outside Frenchtown. At mid-afternoon, the Americans moved forward across the cold plain and frozen river. When word came the Americans were in sight, there was an old Indian smoking at his fireside. The Indian exclaimed, Ho! Oh, the Americans come! I suppose Ohio men come. We give them another chase, alluding to the time they chased General Tupper from the rapids. He walked to the door smoking, apparently very unconcerned, and looked at the Americans formed in line of battle and rushing on them with a mighty shout. He then called out, Kentuck by God, and picked up his gun and ran to the woods. The British retreated stalling the Americans here and there with a small cannon and Indian skirmishers. The fighting moved through Frenchtown and into the nearby forest, ending with sunset. During the darkness of that night, early on January 20th, General Winchester arrived, followed by additional troops over the next several hours. At the nearby British base of Fort Malden, Colonel Henry Proctor assembled a counterattack, Soon, he was leading 525 British and Canadian soldiers and about 800 Indians from several tribes southward toward the Kentucky militiamen and American regulars. Before dawn on January 22, 1813, he had his men in line behind six artillery pieces just yards north of the American camp. 
The American sentries only noticed their approach at the last minute, too late for many of the unprepared militiamen to mount much of a defense. The regular troops held their ground for a while, but soon retreated. General Winchester was unable to stop what was becoming a panicked rout. Resisting Kentuckians were cut down, their colonel was killed, and General Winchester was captured and humiliated by the Indians, who delivered him, stripped of most of his clothing and shivering in the cold, to Colonel Proctor. In Frenchtown itself, a group of Kentuckians did much better. From behind fences and other cover, they repeatedly fought off British assaults, almost capturing one of the British cannons in the close-range tumult. The Kentuckians were shocked when a message arrived from General Winchester advising them to surrender. But surrender they did, setting the stage for one of the most grisly scenes of the War of 1812. The British had accepted the Kentuckian surrender with a promise to protect them from the Indians. Instead, the British quickly marched away, back to Fort Malden, leaving some 60 wounded Kentuckians and the other prisoners under the protection of only a small guard detail. On the day after the battle, Indians wreaked bloody vengeance on the Kentuckians. They tomahawked many of the wounded outright and burned buildings sheltering others while preventing any escape from the flames. Captured Kentuckians, able to move along, were marched off to a harsh captivity. This Battle of the River Raisin was one of the worst defeats in American military history. 934 Americans took part in the battle. Only 33 escaped. Word of this tragedy stunned people back home in Kentucky, but the battle provided Kentucky troops with a war cry, they would shout on battlefields for the remainder of the war, Remember the Raisin! Things went the British way during the early months of 1813. Success in the war in the old Northwest depended largely upon control of the waterways, mainly Lake Erie. Domination of the lake allowed relatively easy and rapid movement of troops and supplies. The British, long a world-dominating naval power, controlled Lake Erie with a fleet of small ships. The British were able to put continuous pressure on what became the most important American stronghold in the area, Fort Miggs. Kentucky militiamen were often among the garrison of strategic Fort Miggs, and they helped defend it against repeated attack and siege. Some of the attempts to relieve the fort from outside proved to be overzealous, however, resulting in more loss of life among the Kentucky troops. On May 5, 1813, while trying to relieve the first siege of Fort Miggs, orders given to Colonel William Dudley were either misunderstood or ignored, and as a result, a large part of his command was destroyed in what has been called Dudley's Defeat. In his official report following the battle, General Harrison makes the following comment about the Kentucky militia. It rarely occurs that a general has to complain of excessive ardor of his men, yet such appears always the case whenever the Kentucky militia are engaged. It is indeed the source of all their misfortunes. They appear to think that valor alone can accomplish anything. Such temerity, although not so disgraceful, is scarcely less fatal than cowardice. A permanent turn of the tide took place when a newly built American fleet took to the waters of Lake Erie. Under the command of Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry, the new ships won a surprising victory over the British fleet on September 10, 1813. Among the crews of Perry's ships, were 150 Kentucky militiamen serving as sharpshooters who plagued the British seamen from high in the rigging of the American vessels. Perry's triumph changed the balance of power in this part of the war almost overnight. Perry's famous victory message would go down in the annals of American naval history. We have met the enemy and they are ours. Two ships, two brigs, one schooner, and one sloop. With no threat from their lakeside flanks, American troops were free to go on the offensive. 
Soon, the British abandoned Detroit and Fort Malden and retreated eastward deeper into Ontario, to the complete disgust of the Indian leader Tecumseh. A new body of Kentucky troops arrived in the theater of war, and they were destined to play a critical role in the fighting. The 1,000-strong 1st Regiment of Kentucky Mounted Rifles learned from the grinding hardships and cruel defeats endured by Kentucky militiamen earlier in the war. Richard Minter Johnson, their colonel, insisted that they be properly equipped and clothed, mounted on good horses, and trained in fast-moving, hard-hitting tactics. Colonel Johnson also enforced firm discipline, something that had been lacking among many earlier Kentucky militia organizations. This regiment joined William Henry Harrison's army, some 3,400 men in all, including the likes of legendary Kentucky Indian fighter William Whitley and Kentucky's elderly governor Isaac Shelby across Lake Erie into Canada. The pursuit of the British through Ontario came to a dramatic end on the banks of the River Thames on October 5, 1813. The British commander agreed to Tecumseh's impatient demands to face the Americans— The result was one of the most decisive strategic defeats suffered by the British and their allies during the War of 1812. At the battlefield, Colonel Johnson was ordered by General Harrison to attack. Seeing that his entire command could not be used to best advantage against the British, he ordered that one battalion would attack the British, the other would attack the Indians. Shouting, Remember the reason! The mounted Kentuckians rode through the thin red line of British infantrymen, which broke and offered little resistance. The Indians fought much harder and had to be pushed out of their woodland hiding places amid close range firefights. Twenty of Johnson's men, led by the 68 year old Colonel William Whitley, were picked to move to an exposed position to draw the fire of Tecumseh's hidden warriors. Johnson rode with this group. These men, fired with a desire to avenge the massacre of the Raisin, knew that the 1,500 guns in the hands of marksmen, as sure of aim as they themselves, were trained upon them. But they neither wavered nor shrank from the sacrifice. When the smoke of the first volley lifted, 15 of these heroes were dying. Colonel Whitley was bleeding from numerous wounds, but still sat erect and beckoned to the battalion to press forward and make the most of the dearly bought advantages of the forlorn hope. At some point in the confused fighting, someone, the historical record is extremely vague on this, shot and killed Tecumseh. With Tecumseh's death, so ended the Indians' eagerness to fight and they joined the surviving British in flight. At last, Kentuckians had fulfilled their goal of ending the Indian menace to their homeland. After this battle, Kentucky was never again under peril of Indian attack. And on this day, Kentucky troops, Johnson's regiment took much of the credit, had been the primary instrument of success in a decisive battle strategically important in American military history. The only other action of significance in the Old Northwest, in which Kentucky militia took part, occurred starting in September 1814. General Duncan MacArthur was ordered by the U.S. War Department to conduct an expedition against Indians on Lake Michigan. Kentucky and Ohio-mounted volunteers comprised MacArthur's force. For nearly two months, the command raided the Canadian countryside and burned most of the mills in the area, causing alarm and panic in the region. The raid culminated in the Battle of Malcolm's Mill. The command returned to American soil on November 18, 1814. This raid terminated the war in the Old Northwest. There was yet another campaign to be fought. Kentucky has always relied upon great rivers of the American West, the Kentucky River, the Ohio River, and the Mississippi River, as an essential trade connection with the rest of the world through the port city of New Orleans. The British put New Orleans, and thus the economic prosperity of Kentucky and Western America, in peril by launching a military expedition against the city late in 1814. 
Kentuckians responded to calls for militiamen to reinforce General Andrew Jackson's motley army defending New Orleans. But the response was feeble in comparison to the Kentucky turnout earlier in the war. The contingent from now war-weary Kentucky arrived in New Orleans poorly clothed and with hardly any weapons. General Jackson was furious, declaring, I've never seen a Kentuckian without a rifle, a deck of playing cards, and a bottle of whiskey. Jackson was not happy with the performance of some Kentucky men during the battle, as a poorly led detachment fled before a British attack on the west bank of the Mississippi River. Fortunately, Jackson's army inflicted overwhelming casualties on the British on the east side of the river. Kentuckians under the command of General John Adair served with General Carl's Tennesseans at the point of heaviest fighting on the east side of the river. The resulting American victory, a ragtag crowd against some of the world's finest professional soldiers, was so one-sided that it became the stuff of myth and legend. A phrase entered the English language as part of a song popular in the 1820s that proclaimed, but Jackson, he was wide awake and not as scared of trifles For well he knew what aim we'd take with our Kentucky rifles So he led us down by Cypress Swamp, the ground was low and mucky There stood John Bull and Marshall Pomp, and here was old Kentucky, old Kentucky The hunters of Kentucky, old Kentucky, the hunters of Kentucky In one of the warfare's great ironies, the treaty ending the War of 1812 had been signed in Europe before the Battle of New Orleans was fought. So slow were communications across the Atlantic. Officially, the war did not end until February 17, 1815, after the United States had ratified the Treaty of Ghent. In many ways, the War of 1812 was Kentucky's war. Kentuckians wanted the war, and they had made a hugely disproportionate contribution to the fighting of it. No less than 60% of all the American casualties in the War of 1812 were from Kentucky. Either Kentucky volunteers, members of the Kentucky militia, or men of the regular United States Army. The war's failures had demonstrated the weakness of relying upon poorly trained militiamen as the bulwark of the defense of the nation. But this lesson paled in the popular glories of Lake Erie, the River Thames, and the Battle of New Orleans. Several years after the War of 1812, a newspaper editor wrote, There is something in the air of Kentucky that makes a man a soldier. Conscious of Kentucky's role in the War of 1812, Kentuckians did believe that of themselves. Kentuckians tried to make sure that their role in that war would never be forgotten. They named many of the Commonwealth's 120 counties after the war's heroes and casualties, Shelby, Harrison, Whitley, Adair, and more. But unlike in many nearby states, they named almost nothing after Native Americans. The bitterness of that frontier era's great struggle would be a lasting part of the Kentucky legacy. Ultimately, Canada was not conquered, but peace was guaranteed between the United States, Canada, and Great Britain. This heralded an age of prosperity in which Kentucky became one of the leading states in the United States of America during the decades before the Civil War. Kentucky owes much to her War of 1812 veterans for their service, sacrifice, dedication, and devotion to duty to the Commonwealth and our nation. Tis a nation of free men where ye were born. Let it ever a free nation be. Though Tecumseh is there with revenge in his breast, by the British in bold array, but we've conquered him oft in the wilds of the West, and we'll conquer us. 
the fight, to the fight, O oh, Americans on, in the name of the good and the free, tis a nation of free men, where ye were born, let it ever a free nation be. Ye unyielding and desperate sons of the brave, who so often your valor have shown, oh, shall ever the British their loved banner wave o'er the land which ye call. To the fight, O oh, Americans, on in the name of the good and the free. Tis a nation of free men where ye. He-